campus and our new uh, University of Minnesota Global Breast Cancer Fellowship. How are we doing with slides? All right, <laughs> wonderful. About a year and a half ago, we expanded the Global Surgery Program uh, at the University of Minnesota to include all surgical subspecialties in anesthesiology. And the reason we did this is because we have a shared vision, we want to share resources, we want to share our partnerships. And for that reason, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Brian Roby from the Department of Oligology, who will formally introduce her friend and our 2024 visiting professor. Thanks, everyone. Um, I'm Brianne Roby. I am a pediatric otolaryngologist here at the University of Minnesota. First of all, I want to thank Dr. Tuttle for actually, like he just mentioned, getting our department involved in the global surgery uh, programming, and also Dr. Kirawala, my chairman, for asking me to help represent um, our department. It is such an honor today to introduce Dr. Kofi Bohaney, who is a professor of otolaryngology, head and neck surgery, and uh, oversees the Division of Facial Plastics at Johns Hopkins University. Dr. Bohaney actually uh, has strong connections to Minnesota, but it took a little extra trip uh, to get here. So he grew up in Ghana. Uh, he was the oldest of a, a large family there. And as soon as he finished high school, uh, left Ghana to start his educational path that involves steps along the way in Russia, eventually in Arkansas, medical school in Tennessee, before landing in Minnesota at the Mayo Clinic for his otolaryngology head and neck residency. After completing residency, he did his fellowship here in the Twin Cities with uh, Dr. Peter Hilger and our Division of Facial Plastics here, and promptly has been out at Johns Hopkins since that time. He is very much an expert around the world in facial reanimation for people with facial paralysis, skull-based surgery, along with um, facial reconstruction for skin cancers, cleft lip and craniofacial, and, and everything else I could list. Uh, he's very much an expert. On a more personal note, before he comes up here, um, for those of us who train at Minnesota, our, our mentors um, mentioned Dr. Bohaney probably on a daily basis. He is legendary here. Uh, we've been told one of the most naturally gifted surgeons and hardest workers that we will ever meet. And uh, after hearing that for years, you assume he will be a little bit larger than life. And then you meet him, as I, uh, I have met numerous times and recently went on a mission trip with him. Uh, however, he's the most humble, kind uh, person I've ever met. And so it is with great honor that I asked Dr. Kofi Bohaney to come up and share with us some of his experiences. We really are all in for a treat. Thank you so much. Would well, this work? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to come back to Minnesota. I've been a wimp since I left, maybe 19 years, dealing with the cold. Before I moved to Minnesota, actually, I spent some time in Russia. So this was the African kid in Minnesota, and everybody's dressed warm, and it didn't faze me. But yesterday was cold. So, <laughs> so it's, it's really a pleasure to come back and to talk about something that is dear to me. I grew up in Ghana. I was motivated to go to, into medicine because of the lack of expertise that I recognized even when I was 18 years old. The story goes that I was in boarding school in a city called Kumase. One of my classmates went on a joy ride on school, which was not permitted, got into an accident, and we picked him and took him to the nearest major hospital. And we are thinking, oh, this kid is bleeding. And when we get in there, people are just going to rush, you know, like we see on the movies, pick him up and tamponade the bleeding. It didn't happen. And 16-year-olds were begging for help. I saw that there was something wrong with that. It was the beginnings of my thoughts that I'm going to finish and I'm going to come back here and I'm going to do something about it. And sometimes you're motivated to do those things and it never happens. But in my case, it did happen. And I'm going to talk a little bit about it. Um, the experience I'm going to share is, I won't call myself such an expert in global surgery, I've done surgeries in almost all the continents, so maybe that counts. But, but there are certain things that I have picked up which are not written about, which is what sort of I've called, um, distilled and I want, I want, I want to share. Um, so I have nothing to disclose. This is a picture that was given to me when we were in Mexico. 
It's a picture of me in Liberia. And you can see, although I have nothing to disclose, I was in a very pensive mood. This kid was sent from the Mercy ship with Noma. A Mercy ship couldn't do anything for her. And they brought, it, brought her to us in a small town in a place called Phoebe. And by global surgery standards, we will call it under resourced area. And now we had to preserve her life. And I was sitting, we took turns throughout the night trying to take care, care of it. So that at that time kept me thinking something needs to change. So nothing to disclose, but a lot to talk about. Um, when we hear about global health, when you hear the word global health, what are some of the words that comes to your mind? And then when you hear about global surgery, what comes to mind? In some people, to them, it means mission trips. Um, and, um, and that's usually their entryway. In some people who are in the realm of public health and glo uh, global health uh, arena, they will think about vaccines and, and pills, right? Um, some people, the word always comes, global health means underserved areas. Okay, I've done work in Germany, trying to build up skills there. That's not an underserved area. So it doesn't just limit to underserved area. Um, when we think about it, we always, always think about resource challenged areas. Um, and that is true. We also come up with ways we want things to be sustainable. We want to build capacity. And that has become part of our lingo. And you heard about it. That's your emphasis here in, 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 in Minneapolis, Minneapolis. Now, if any one of you have read the book, Cutting for Stones, to me, that is my um, um, come a picture of a, a global health surgeon living in a very small corner of the of the world, very picturesque, like I, I in Cameroon here, working in a small operating room, doing a lot of good. That's good for some people, not good for everyone, or appropriate for some, not appropriate for everyone. So there are different ways to be connected when it comes to global health, global surgery. Now, one thing we can say is that health as we saw during COVID, regardless of where you are, affects everyone everywhere, right? So you, you can't be isolated in Minneapolis thinking um, that doesn't concern me, it really does. And I, I'm gonna point some things out. The, the um, lack of surgical care in some African countries has to do with policies that are in the US, in the UK. So they are all in, inter, interconnected. So that's the definition that we give for global health. Now, so it usually takes efforts from multiple places to solve one place, uh, or to solve a health problem. One place that global health has made the big difference is in the disease malaria, right? Malaria is the biggest killer uh, in Africa, kills one out of every four child before they age, uh, reach the age of five. I've gotten malaria many times. I got cerebral malaria, so I've been working and studying all this time with half of my brain, if you can believe that. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but recently there are vaccines that have been developed uh, for malaria and it's making a huge difference. That shows you the power of, of when multiple institutions come together to try to solve a health problem. Now we have a, a pill for COVID, right? And, and this was developed within the past two years. Now, vaccines, pills are easy to travel and they solve a lot of problems. But we all know that you can't use pills to solve surgical problems. Some people have to go. If somebody's bones are broken, pills won't do anything. Vaccines won't do anything. And in the past, global health initiatives have focused on infectious diseases to the extent that nobody thought a dent can be made in surgery. Now we know that is not true. And that's why we are here talking about this subject. Um, this kid with kyphoscoliosis from Ethiopia travels to Ghana because someone set up a scoliosis uh, center and is able to, to get surgery for, for that kid. This kid in Kumasi, the same hospital I talked to you about, has grown to age 10 and has a cleft left and palate defect. You will never see that in the US because that in that place, that expertise didn't exist. Um, this kid in Rwanda has a massive amyloblastoma which when was small, could have been enucleated, resected, spared her, his jaw, but the expertise wasn't there, so it grows this big. This kid in Germany was born with paralysis on the right side, and the place they had didn't have the expertise for doing fancy gracilis flaps, so I helped them do it. That's global health. Um, so with all these examples, this kid in Peru with a tiny little jaw, born in a hospital, stays and spends the first year of their life in the hospital with the trick because that's the only way they knew how to take care of it. 
and global health uh, surgical initiatives can change that. And again, a patient in Rwanda with cancer and a patient in Bangladesh. So as you can see, regardless of everywhere, we can all agree that everyone everywhere deserves a chance for a life-saving surgery when they need one. And that's what the emphasis of global surgery is, to sort of bridge the gap. And it's not only in underserved areas, it's even true in Germany, it's true in Peru, it's true in the US and, and, and multiple places. So I'm going to share with you um, the current definitions and certain words that I've picked out of it that are sort of guided what I do when I, I talk about uh, global health issues. There is a, the need that we've established, there's a problem with access, and the last portion is quality. When you see pictures of global health initiatives, you're going to see an operating room with a lot of people with some green gowns and um, some tables that are rusted and some um, old instruments that is not attractive to me, right? It's not attractive. It doesn't make global surgery something attractive that people want to go into. So it, I hope that doesn't equate with equality. So when we are talking about global health uh, surgery initiatives, we want to solve a need, we want to provide access, but we want to provide it at the highest quality possible. Um, the second thing, we, our point is that global surgery doesn't depend on surgeons alone. In fact, in some of the groups that I've traveled with, the most popular person on the group is usually a biomedical engineer because they go around and fix all the equipments in the hospital that have been donated that are not working. So it's just not surgeons. It, it includes the anesthesiologists, the, the, the nurses, um, the biomedical engineers. And the last thing that I want to emphasize is that there are some forces that are at play that if you don't recognize, you will only be building capacity, recognizing that in a few years, you will lose it. So you don't make any big, big improvement. It's a key point that I would like to talk, talk about. And in that realm, I'd, I'd call it making sure that everything that we do actually preserves and improves li livelihoods. So when I talk about livelihoods, one out of every five physician in the US probably was born outside the US, studied outside the US, brain drained to the US, contributed to the US health, health force, at the loss of that other country, right? So if you go and build capacity in Rwanda and Rwanda doesn't keep their doctors and surgeons and they move to the UK, you're starting all over. So if we plan, um, we have plans on building capacity, we have to think about how you retain those people. And it doesn't come with only, this is uh, Ghana, my own country, every month about 20 nurses leave and the UK government actually actively recruits them. So the, the health care force in Ghana which is not up to um, par in terms of numbers, it's also losing these numbers. So ret retention becomes a big part of this whole, whole picture. Um, I'm gonna skip this, okay. And, and why? why? Why is that the case? You cannot legislate. The governments in Africa cannot say, if you train here, you can't travel out. It's not possible because everybody's going to go to where the money is. It's just as simple as it, it is. If you do not create the conditions when you build the capacity for people to be able to uh, improve their livelihoods, they are going to leave. So when we think about global surgical um, initiatives, we have to actually include that aspect to it. How can we improve livelihoods of the people that we are building capacity so that they stay where they've been trained? Um, in 2013, I wrote an article in the C on CNN thinking about these things and trying to see how we can sort of so so solve these issues because retention is a big portion. My experience has sort of transitioned. I started with mission trips and then long-term relationships with a particular hospital and then progressing to building a hospital. So I'm gonna walk you through how I've sort of transitioned through, through these steps. Short mission trips to me is the entry point for many people. It's very valuable. It is where you learn what a country needs. You don't just go to one place and say, I am coming to do cleft lifts and pallets, right? When, when their issue is not cleft lifts and palace, they have something else. So short mission trips allows you to establish relationship with the place, understand what their needs are, modify what you do, and then build, build up, up, up from there. It is what excites medical students these days, is their entry point. And if you don't get them in, you can't, you can't expect them to become global surgical experts later on. So to me, it's the, it's the entry, entry, entry point. And I'm going to give you an example of my experience 
in the same hospital I talked to you about when I was a, a medical student. So in 2014, when I interviewed, 20, 20, 2003, when I interviewed for a fellowship here at University of Minnesota, um, my uh, one of the people who interviewed me was Dr. Sidman. Unfortunately, he passed away uh, some years back. He asked me, so what do you want to do with your life? And I told him, um, you know, I want to get all the skills and I want to go and give back to Ghana and build all these programs. And I kid you not, he told me, you are just BSing me so you can get a spot in the fellowship program. And that's what he said to me straight up. So I said, well, I, I, I'm not kidding. So after I got the position as the fellow, I told them, I want you to go to Ghana with me to establish a, 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 a mission trip in this hospital. He said, Ghana? Well, I mean, we, we, don't, we go to Peru, it's right here. No, I said, no, Ghana. And I'm not BSing you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I traveled with him and another nurse, and we did a sightseeing. Uh, and then after that, um, the group went to that hospital for many, many years, and we established a cleft craniofacial clinic. Um, now, my classmates who had gone to medical school in Ghana when I left told me there are no clefts in Ghana. You know, we don't see them. I didn't believe it, right, till I got there. When I got there, there were over 200 cleft cases waiting to be done. And the interesting thing was that we're of all ages. I'm seeing cleft kids 10, 11, 25 years old, but they were telling me there were no clefts. They were hiding. They didn't come out. Nobody was taking care of them. It was a stigma, right? So they come out and then they shop at night. They don't go to school. But that was the first entry point. I said, oh, there's a problem here. So they said, if there's a problem, we are not thinking about, we are going to come and just do a lot of club cases and solve the problem. So from 2006 and 2009, I traveled with this group to Kumasi. This is one of the nurses, these are one of the nurses who established that program. And as you can see, this is a list of patients that we do in a week, over 100 cases, okay? And then the following year, when you go, there'll be 150 to do. And then the following year, there'll be 200 cases. And then, uh, and then, and then you leave a lot of cases undone. But the plan that we had was that you cannot take care of all these cleft patients. There's a big backlog. So you have to train people and let them do it. Now, the success of this is that slowly introduce every aspect of craniofacial care from including a dentist, a speech pathologist, child psychologist, um, as the surgeons, biomedical engineers, and try to really put up a team. And that hospital has their own craniofacial center now. Now, this is the thing that I'm most proud of. I've never done a cleft at that uh, hospital for about 15 years. They don't need us, okay? They actually now have their own outreach programs. They travel to Togo, to Ivory Coast, to Benin, and they do cleft trips and then they've published their experience. So mission trips can be the stepping stone to establish some longitudinal relationship. And always you have to have a turning point. There has to be a pivot point that you don't have to go back again. Otherwise it will become something that you do year after year and they'll become dependent on, on, on you. So that's, that's how I see short-term mission trips. It helps identify the need establish the relationship with people and um, it allows young trainees to gain a sort of kind of spark a plug and then but always you, sh you should have a, p a pivot a point there's an unintended consequence of short mission trips on uh, uh, unintended consequence which is usually making people dependent on you so year after year they are waiting for the next group to come so nothing gets done in in between the next level up to me was it's finding one place and, and making sure that we really make a big impact. And to me, uh, we did that in Rwanda. If anybody knows the history of Rwanda after the genocide, all their doctors just left the country, some were killed and there was nothing. So for a period of 12 years, we've been going with a group. The first year that we went, there was absolutely nothing. I mean, no infrastructure, no nurses, no, just nothing. Um, uh, uh, I, I will go back to uh, Rwanda. The other place that I'll talk about is actually per Peru. Per Peru is different from Ghana in the sense that they have beautiful hospitals. They have the surgeons, right? They do great stuff. But sometimes there's just some specific thing that they want to do that they can do and then you can help, help there. In the children's hospital in Peru, when we started going there, 
every kid that was born with Pierre Rubin syndrome had a trick and they stayed in the hospital for the first year of their lives. Because if they discharged them, some of them went and died because the parents couldn't take care of tricks. So they actually literally stayed in the hospital for like a year. Um, we had learned how to do jaw distractions with osteo by osteogenesis, uh, uh, jaw distractions. So we started introducing uh, jaw distractions to, to, to that hospital. And, and, and for now, uh, multiple indications for it. We started with Pierre Rubin syndrome, then Golden Heart syndrome, people with Apet syndrome, and then some traumatic cases, osteomyelitis with fusion. So a big, broad, um, broad um, in indication. I'm just going to go through this quickly. Um, but the interesting thing is that after a year or two of introducing jaw distraction to this hospital, it has become the standard of care. Now people don't have to stay in the hospital. Now I will, I will do a case at, at Hopkins. When I take the, the, the distractors off, I keep it. I sterilize it. It goes to me with me to um, Peru and it's got a second life. Right? And then you talk to KLS and all these companies and then they give you distractors. And so this is a hospital with infrastructure right? and sophisticated surgeon. But this is something that is here, but not there. And just over time, you, you can introduce that uh, level of care. So sometimes it's not only resource limited areas, but just some specific techniques that you can, you can, you can, you can pass on. We went on from doing um, these types of surgeries and going on to microsurgery. The, in the children's hospital, they had a lot of uh, children with massive tumors in the jaw. If they resected the tumors, I'm going to show you examples. Let's skip these. If they resect the tumors, there's a gap in the, in the mandible, but uh, if they're small, you can do a bone graft. If it's, if it's big, you need a free flap. And these are two-year-olds, five-year-olds, and they had no experience doing microsurgery in children like that. So we started introducing microsurgery in children. Um, I personally grew as a surgeon working in a hospital. I've done most, the most number of pediatric fibula flaps at that hospital, not even in the US. So I learned a lot from there that I brought back to me, with me, to my practice in the, in, in the US. So sometimes it's not just given, you actually get something back. So with, with this uh, microsurgery in children, um, we, uh, we learned a lot that when you do fibulas, grab, fibula flaps in pediatric patients, actually the bone grows with them. Okay, and, and you, can see, you can see the growth when you go back to take the plates. So usually in adults, we will take a fibula flap and we use titanium plates to fixate the bone. In children, if we use titanium, we would wait a year later and take the plate out. When you go in, you will see the bones are fused and actually it, it, it's growing. Uh, and so that's something that we didn't know and the experience that we, we gained from there. We in included the local plastic surgeons I haven't done a fibula flap in that hospital for years. Now they are sort of self-sufficient. So that's an example of taking a place that has the doctors, has the infrastructure, and you can add to the sophistication of what they do. The next example, um, I'm gonna skip these. The next example is Rwanda, as I was talking about. With Rwanda, no doctors, no infrastructure, big need. Initially, there were war injuries, injuries from the Civil War. So they, they come in with machete cuts, people without their noses, without their ears, so soft tissue work. But once we did those, then, then followed patients with tumors. This is, this is here that you can have multiple institutions banding together to try to make a lot of difference. I know there are people from Minnesota that go to Rwanda. Here we had a big group from Hopkins, a group from uh, Mass Eye and Year joining together to try to really break, build up something so substantial. Luckily, a lot of the people you're seeing here train from Minnesota. So the Minnesota connection goes very, very, very far. Uh, so when we go, it's as if we are working in the US. You have an anesthesiologist, in intensivist, ICU nurse, but the idea was we want to pair ourselves with someone local so we can build an infrastructure that can sustain once we leave. So this is a big group of about 23 people. Over the years, you can't keep sending all these people there. So as their expertise increased, our, our, the size of our group dwindled. You can see the number of people that are in, in this um, 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 group. And then we started a plastic surgery training program. So for a period of five years, we uh, took people through the plastic surgery training program. 
And then the ones that were interested in microsurgery has, um, helped them get to Taiwan to get additional microsurgery training. And now they are back. And in Rwanda now, they have a head and neck cancer clinic. They have radiation oncology unit. They have microsurgeons. And when we ask them, when can we come back and help? They said, uh, we'll let you know because we don't need you anymore. And that is how you want it to, want it to be. So that's, that's our experience in, in Rwanda. Okay, let's skip these. The complexity of things that you do there is not limited by where the place is. It's just you have to set up the structure and do it. This patient was a policewoman with a tongue cancer that had failed radiation. And we did a total glossectomy, a reconstructor with an ALT flap. Um, and she is five years out, has survived it. So the complexity of things that have we've been able to do in that small place has not been limited by what we usually see is resource limited areas. If you set the infrastructure, you can do uh, multiple things. And every year when we went back, she would come back for a follow up, follow up visit. Now there's a story about Rwanda that there was a child with a JNA who came to a children's hospital here, not in Minnesota, to have the JNA resected. And they lost about, um, about 30 units, gave about 30 units of blood, couldn't take the tumor out, packed, stabilized him, sent him back to Rwanda. And we went back to Rwanda and took the tumor out and gave five units of blood in that under-resourced area. To say that you don't always need this big infrastructure to be able to do these so-called complicated stuff. As long as you, you set things in place, those things uh, can, can be done. So that's the story with, with Rwan, Ru, Rwanda. Uh, so Rwanda is nearing self-sufficiency. The story with Rwanda is that as, out of goodwill, a lot of money was poured into that country. So you can't use the Rwanda story to say it's the same story for Ghana, Nigeria, Mozambique. You, Rwanda actually stands out. They got a lot of money from everywhere. but you don't need that like, amount of money to do all these things. And th that tells, it takes you to my experience in, in Cameroon. Cameroon, this is their operating room. Th this is their operating room. It's not, they didn't get any money from all these NGOs, but this is the operating room here. And I was asked to help with a kid um, who was shot in the face because there's a civil war go going on there. And I'll show you a picture of that kid. She, if she, if she were in the US, she would have needed a face transplant, but she's not, she can't come here. So we had to find a, a way to, to do something about it. Now I put this picture up because this is one of my colleagues at Hopkins. His name is Wayne Cook. Out of this small hospital, he's probably single-handedly treated the most head and neck cancer surgeons on the continent of Africa. So he picked a place, low resource, decided I'm going to start a fellowship program. He spends about three months, uh, about half of his time in, in Cameroon. And he, he picks a fellow, trains them a year, makes sure that that fellow sticks around and then trains other people. And he's done that over, over, over 10 years. And single-handedly out of this small operating room that we are talking about, trained the, the most number of head and neck cancer patients, uh, head and neck surgeons on the continent of, of Africa. So it doesn't, requires some big infrastructure. If you kind of put the elements in place, you can make a, 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 big, a, big, a big difference. So this girl, uh, I always say when elephants fight, fight is the grass that suffers. So there is a, a civil war in, in Cameroon and um, so just came to their house, shot, shot her for the face and that's how she presented. Um, I got a call that, can you help this kid? Because Hop, John Hopkins has a face transplant program. And I said, yes, and she looks like she needs a face transplant, but she can't come to Hopkins and just forgot about it. And a month later, they called me again and then and sent me a, a picture that she actually survived and, and can, can something be done. So, so then I, so I went to that same place and this is how she looked after you took all those S X face of no palate, no nose, no mandible, um, tongue just kind of uh, partly tr truncated. And um, so that's how she looked. And this is the resources that, we were provided with. She needs microsurgery um, and we needed an operating room, this anesthesia machine. There were willing nurses to take care of them. There was this head and neck surgeon and myself and um, one of the head and neck fellows 
who's training in that program. And we said, yeah, we're going to do two free flaps to try to come and pick care of her. And so that was the team. And that's, that's all we had. Again, to emphasize that I don't like the term um, resource limited area to use as the reason why we can, can't do some, we can't practice at the highest level of our skill. Okay, so for example, one common problem in Africa is NOMA, right? NOMA is a flesh eating and diseases. We do a lot of delta pectoral flaps. They don't work. They don't work. And uh, we know what may work, but we say this is a resource limited place. So we don't push the envelope to be able to offer the highest level of our skill. In this particular case, we thought this is what the kid needed. And so that day, the first step we did um, a fibula flap to re reconstruct the maxilla and the palate and end the mandible. And we use an anterior lateral thigh flap to recreate the buccal space and put the soft tissue. And then we went back later and then did a forehead flap for the, for the nose. And then after that, she's had like two re refinements to get her to be something more, more presentable. And all was done in that tiny little place that you're looking at. Um, but if we really want to bridge the gap, we need more than that little place that you're looking at. You, you need more than the willing people. Sometimes you have to build the infrastructure. Sometimes you have to build the infrastructure. So that takes me to building a hospital. Now, my experience with trying to build a, a specialty surgical hospital. Now, I'm not trying to build something that would take care of diabetic patients, hypertension. That's a huge undertaking. I'm saying subspecialty surg surgical center that focuses on a few surgical problems. So it becomes the center of expertise that can be sort of multiplied. And in that way, you can build capacity pretty quickly. And um, so that's what we decided to do. If we have something like that, it gives us high volume and we can use that to train people. It, it allows us to tackle more complex problems and then so we can have better, better outcomes. Uh, and there are examples. It's not something that I'm inventing. This um, um, doctor here is, was an orthopedic surgeon at the Hospital for Special Surgeries in New York. And uh, he decided he wanted to take care of patients with kyphosis and scoliosis. And so he built an orthopedic spine center in Ghana. It is by far the most advanced spine center on the continent to the extent that patients from the US go there when they need some level of complexity that they can't find here. It, it's unbelievable. But he started with a specialty center and because of the volume, their expertise is very, very high. Um, and, and, so, so, and then there's another place in Sudan that is focused on cardiac diseases because they concentrate their expertise on a specific disease pro pro process. They can gain and train people pretty quickly. So that's what we are trying to do. And so we decided to build this hospital that we call the West African Institute for Special Surgery. And we're going to use this vehicle to attract experts from the diaspora, to attract experts from the University of Minnesota, to attract uh, experts from Hopkins, to concentrate them in one place, be able to attract volume, and be able to quickly build a build cap capacity. So I, we started working on this many years first got the land. This land is built right next to that orthopedic hospital that I just talked to you about, just so we can share, share resources. Um, so this is the orthopedic campus here, and this is our, our campus next to it. Um, I got some people to, from Germany to draw the, the plans for me, um, four operating rooms. If, you, if you've gone to most African uh, hospitals, you see a ward with a lot of beds, right? And uh, curtains, and that's all the privacy we we get now. We have private rooms, private forty bed uh, rooms, uh, forty bed uh, hospital uh, with ICUs because I want to practice at the highest skill that I have practiced in the U.S. So if I invite you to come there, the only transition is taking a plane. It's not like you're you're having to MacGyver yourself to 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 be able to practice global surgery like we see in in, in pictures. Okay, so this is um, one of my proudest days when we had to go break the ground. My dad was there and said the opening prayer. And I said, oh, all the money he paid for my tuition paid off. So that, that, was, that was good. Um, and, and then a year later, we have this structure. And um, it, it's, a, it's a beautiful, beautiful place, not like what you have here, but it, it will serve, serve the purpose. And we've sought partnership with industry. Um, to try to um, 
make us their center of excellence, their gateway into onto, to the West Africa. Give us capital equipment so that so that we can we can actually use them. We will pay for them and 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 not work with only donated stuff, right? Make it make it um, 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 viable. So. I keep stressing these things that because it's global surgery doesn't mean you always have to be innovative, like use things that you don't use when in your home institutions. So that's the environment that we are trying to create. Um, we are starting a pituitary um, a center there to do endoscopic pituitary surgery because nobody does them. They all get radiation and it doesn't work, right? Um, Dr. Kono was a graduate with me from Mayo did his fellowship here at the University of Minnesota, is one of the busiest robotic urologists in Minneapolis, and he's part of this project. And we are begging, begging everyone to give us a robot because we want to, to, to use the robot there. Why? Because it's the skill level. He tells me, when I do a prostate protector, uh, a robotic prostatectomy, I'm faster at it, that's my level of skill. Why do I have to go start now doing open prostates or even lap prostate? I want to practice at my highest level of skill. So this is global health, and it doesn't necessarily mean adjust and bring down your skill, skill level. So that's, that's what we are trying to, to set up. Um, now, how are we going to get expertise? We are going to rely on rotating specialists from the West. Some Africans, some are not Africans. Um, we are going to find a core of people who have trained as surgeons and build up their skills, and hopefully with the aim that we want to retain them. I, we don't want to give them the skills and then, then they, they just go away. Um, one thing that we will find very, very helpful is that University of Minnesota has a global surgical problem, a program. Hopkins has a global surgical pro program, program. Duke has one. And everybody goes to the same country, different times, does different things. And if the, uh, we are duplicating stuff, right? To me, this is a, a center that says, you all want to do this? You can't be part. You don't have to go and borrow space from some hospital. This is there for you. And so coordinated partnership with multiple global surgical initiatives can actually allow us to push the envelope and get, and get, uh, and get further. Um, we're creating many, many fellowships that um, surgeons from across the con con continent can come and spend six months and learn how to do microsurgery or learn how to do pituitary surgery or learn how to fix mid fascia fractures or learn how to do this specific uh, procedure and then take it back to their country. So this, this is the idea. Up here is University of Minnesota General Surgery, Global Surgery Initiative right here. And this is Hopkins and this is Duke, University of Wisconsin. So you, you get the picture, right? So we will have so much concentrated expertise in one place, people will take notice. And if it, if it works, then you can sort of duplicate. So that's, that's the idea that we have here. So the hospital is open for, um, uh, open right now. We are beginning to, uh, we're going to break, do the grand opening in two months and we are already taking patients. I'll tell you an interesting story. Right now in Ghana, if you have the means and you need surgery, you come to the US, Germany, UK, it, or India, right? The first person patient sign up for this hospital is actually from India coming to Ghana for, to get a microsurgery for um, a facial paralysis. Because I do a lot of them and I offered him, you can see me in the US or you can see me in Ghana. Which one do you want? Oh, I'll go to Ghana. So this is a reverse of what has already been happening. So you see the specialties that we are starting with, urology, neurosurgery, sleep medicine, plastic surgery, head and neck oncology, pediatric cranial facial, pain and interventional, interventional pain. And as we, our capacity grows, we will add to it. And what are some of the lessons that I've learned? By far, if you want to build capacity anywhere, you have to train locally. Um, so imagine if I, I came here as a college student, but if I had trained as a physician and I moved here to train as a surgeon and I'm young, I'm married and I have a kid and they start school here and I gain my skills and my kids are high school, I'll say, oh, I want them to go to University of Minnesota. I'm not taking them to University of Ghana. I'm not going back. And nobody should ever fault me, right? So if I start my training here and in the, in the prime of my life, 
there is no way I'm going to be going back to disrupt my family's dynamics. So if I, if I want to keep people, I have to train them locally. That's number one. Number two, if you train them locally, you have to make sure that you retain them because there are forces that are global that are pulling everyone. And from Harvard to um, uh, um, University of Minnesota to Mayo to the small place in Ghana, money talks. If you offer someone something that is going to improve their livelihood, they are going to move there. So, but if I am able to create a good condition for a new young surgeon in Ghana, guaranteed they are not leaving. They're going to stay because I know they party all the time. Their lives are better than mine. I, I work all the time and they have time to dance. So if you train them locally and you create the conditions, they will stay. Um, building surgical infrastructure doesn't need to be a big institution. Usually small, specific um, disease centers, uh, uh, centers like what we are doing can be one way to do it. And then coordinating efforts from multiple places can join together to really uh, make a big, big difference. Thank you so much. And I will take some questions. Wow, um, outstanding. Um, we have a, a sign-up sheet here for anybody who wants to uh, work with uh, Dr. Bohemi in uh, Ghana. So just it's a first come, first serve. So sign up and you can go to Ghana. Are there questions for this uh, amazing uh, individual? So, so I've been asked this question many, many times, and I don't know the answer to that. Everybody says, where did the funding come from? I don't know. So the, the, <laughs> it, it is true, I, but, but I'll give you the real answer. Number one, a lot of the um, endeavors that come from here, they try to go through the government. And I'm not bashing the government. If you go to the government, this hospital is going to cost 10 times the amount. That's number one. Number two, if you deal with governments, particularly in Africa, there's a lot of politics behind. When this party is in power, you are favored. As soon as it changes, you are in trouble. A lot of the people in gov the government actually didn't know we were building this hospital. I didn't tell anyone. They just found out last week when I sent out, you are invited, right? So the, I, right now, I don't owe anyone, right? Um, number three, where did the funding come from? Um, I'm not good at asking people for money. I'm just terrible, right? But I found that sometimes when you start a journey and people see what you're doing, they want to be part of it, right? So this is something I wanted to do. So, so a bunch of my brothers are physicians. I, I re, uh, just kind of, you have to give me money, you give me money, you give me money. So I took their money and then we get started. And once we got started, my patients gave me money and this person gave me money. And so if you ask me how, I don't know, but that's how it started. Sometimes you have to take the leap of faith. You just get it started and then, and then things um, fall in place. Yes. Um, I guess my question is, how did you build the confidence? Because me and Nigeria myself, I feel like sometimes like, you know, in the infrastructure and in our, um, medical climate and everything, there seems to be a lack of confidence. So how did you build the confidence that these West African countries can do that, are capable to do that? Um, I'm not sure if I had to master the confidence is that certain things don't sit right with you, okay? Um, so let's say I'm, I, I, live, I'm, I work in Baltimore. There's a direct 11 hour flight from Dallas airport to Accra, 11 hours. I would do a pituitary surgery two and a half hours, two and a half hours. Then I'll get on the plane, I'll get to Accra, and then I'll see a kid, 21, blind, with a pituitary tumor, and they were changing the glasses. All they do is change your glasses, change your glasses, and it's a tumor. I said, why, how is that possible, right? So for me, I said this yesterday, my success is meaningless if the place I was born and grew up doesn't benefit from all the expertise I've been handed. So is that confidence? It didn't take that much confidence. Yeah. I found that the confidence that you have in yourself 
one of the reoccurring themes is to continually work yourself out of a job in these places. Um, so two questions, was that your goal going into this or was that something you learned through your journey and experience and is that your goal in Ghana? Um, it is my goal in Ghana. It's something I recognized. Um, I wouldn't say I went into it one. So when I started mission trips, I told you it's my entry point. It's an exciting thing. I look forward to it. I look forward to it. But when I realized that actually they don't need me, it was a mixed feeling. So what, what am I going to do? I, I go there every these months. What am I going to do? But then you realize that actually it's a good thing. So for example, the group that I go to Rwanda with post-COVID, we we're just telling them, oh, it's time. We want to come back. And they say, oh, um, you know, can, can only three people come? We don't need the 20 people, just three. And then the three people went. And then they said, when can we come back next? Um, let's think about it. They don't need us, right? So, so yes, you need to work yourself out of that job. There will be more to do. So then the level of involvement and sophistication goes up, right? Here now, as everything is data-driven, evidence-driven. Over there, they just want access and take care of people. You can transition to another level of, of invol involvement. So yes, you want to pivot and work yourself out of the job. Yeah. Well, Sophia. Yeah. Okay, so ch charity ho hospitals are charity hospitals, and you, you always have to go and get funds. I'm not good at asking for money, I said, right? So this model has to be sustainable. That word goes around, and it means it has to be economically sustainable. So we don't want to turn people away, but we are not going to announce to everybody this is a free charity hospital because guaranteed there are people with, with means who would want and come and get free care. What we are offering them is that, well, you had an emergency case, you can't get on the plane and fly to Germany, you can get it here. Oh, actually, you prefer to have care at home, you can get it here. And actually, you know, you're actually going to get a really, really world-class Care because your surgeons are um, trained here and there, and this is what they do, and they are working at that level. So if you give people the option, get taken care of home, and you will get the best care, those with means will pay, right? Those without means will say, we would raise funds to support you. And raising funds, where it comes from, nobody knows, it's an internal thing. So that's how. And then how do you retain people? You pay them well. And then after, after that, they see that they are contributing to something bigger than themselves. And three, that actually I love working close to home with my family. And, 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 then, and then four, um, I'm doing well, right? So, so all those elements, if the livelihood portion is not part of it, guaranteed, when the next big thing comes on, they'll move on, okay? So there are models for that. Um, that's why I actually built right next to that orthopedic hospital. It's the same model that they had. They've retained their nurses. They've retained their neurosurgeons. And I'm just kind of just riding their coat, coat tail, a tail, tail coat. I have a question from the Zoom audience. Okay. That, uh, from Peter Hilger. Do you see the coordination for care and administration of the center locally managed or overseen by an international board or foundation or a combination? I think all of that, Bob. So the, again, the expertise, like we said earlier on, is no global, it doesn't lie with surgeons only, right? There are people who are administrators who can tell you this is how to run it, and they have the expertise because they've done it here and hopefully they'll be able to pass it on to people there. So eventually I'd want to transition, learn from here, pass on expertise, and then work ourselves out of a job. And Dr. Hilja, I came to see you in Minneapolis and you are in somewhere very warm in Florida ahead. I'm very disappointed. <laughs> yeah. Yes.
Very important question. You remember I said there are some interdependent forces that play that we usually don't run. That's one of them. Um, there are some characteristics of a global surgeon. One is being culturally aware, right? I am Guinean. There are some funny stories that I can tell you. There's a patient from that same hospital that I told you about who needed surgery. They asked me to come and help, but they told them there is a doctor coming from America to help you, right? So I got in there, I see this patient and I tell them, I was talking to the physician, this is what we're going to do. And actually, I don't think the surgery we thought you needed is indicated. The patient was disappointed, but turned to the local surgeon and said, I thought you said there's a surgeon from America coming to, to help me. Where is that surgeon? And he said, that's him. And he looked very disappointed. I looked like him. I spoke like him. I understood him, but I didn't look like the American surgeon. So there are some cultural issues, right? When I started going in there, they were thinking, why are you coming here? What's this? What's in for you? Are you coming to take our job, right? So you have to have people buy in. Let them know that you are partners. Be very open. Learn where they are and meet them where they are. Don't come that I know better, right? I'm going to teach you how to do it. It won't work. So yes, um, and I'm doing the legwork. So if you want to come to Ghana, uh, no problem. You will have to, you can circumvent all those steps, right? Okay, there was a question here, yeah. So uh, if I can rephrase the question, medical students here who want to be, to be involved in this global surgical thing, yeah, how can they do it? Actually, you know, they, like I said, the mission level is the entry point for medical students. Piggyback, going back to your question, right? One thing that people don't want to see is that medical students are practicing on them. So a lot of these groups that go some will take medical students, some will say we don't take medical students. But to me, I want to take medical students. But you understand that you are taking care of people, it's your entry point and you should know where your role is because that's what sparks your interest and your commitment. So yes, there's a, there's a role for a medical student. And then a medical student connects with a medical student there and they build a lifelong relationship. Yesterday we were talking at dinner that that's how you measure resident to med resident, medical student to medical student. And as your careers grow, you grow together. You never know how, where it's gonna to lead to. So I see the me medical missions as the entry point, but for the place that we are building, when we have the research arm and the medical students say, I want to go do a four, six week rotation, the infrastructure will be there. We've seen this in some of our partnerships as we're trying to build local surgeons and get them well trained. Um, then the local people still are asking, I want an American surgeon. And so my question is, is you know, if our organizations fix that we're teaching locals, but you have other organizations kind of coming in behind you and saying, no, our American surgeons will do those surgeries. How do you get more partnership and buy-in from all the organizations so that you don't have some really trying to build up the Locally and others undermining it by kind of doing these trips when they come in and out. Yeah, so that, that is one of the unintended negatives of short term trips inefficient use of resources working against each other. And if we don't coordinate it, we will have that problem. So it's important that um, when you establish, you know, multiple people um, go, you should sort of standardize what you do. One group does the, the cleft lips, the other one does the uh, complications. It, it just doesn't work. And then, and then efforts are just not being built up. Um, one way to go around 
the cultural issue is that the surgeon coming from the worst is better, is to really let the local surgeons become the spokespeople. In, in Rwanda, when we have a patient, right, the person who is talking to the surgeon, telling them what the plan is going to be, is the local surgeon, right? This is what we're going to do. And, uh, and so it, it's an tip. So they hear their voice, they know they are their lead surgeon, they are re really their um, uh, caretakers. And after we are gone, they're going to do their follow ups. So over time, they gain that confidence. Um, and that's what we've seen in Rwanda, really. Yeah. Is that okay?